Hello students, we are going to see in this video about eco-friendly technologies. See, as the days go by, we need to look out for uh, things and technologies and methods which are ecologically friendly, environment friendly. Okay, so that is what this chapter is about. It's a pretty interesting topic. Okay, and initially, let us just start off with indigenous and modern technologies. And there are many things that have indigenous as well as modern technology. What is indigenous? Indigenous means something that they have been doing it traditionally in their native place, in their own method, natural methods. Those are called indigenous technology. And modern is just replacing that with modernized form of technology. So that is modern. Two examples let us quickly see. One is about weaving and the other one is about fishing. When you come to weaving, the indigenous methods, what do we see here is that it is traditional hand weaving. Okay, they used to take a lot of time. It seems in Filipinos, even 400 BC, that is the time when they started. And uh, they used to take for one meter to be woven, one meter of cloth. They would take one full week. Can you imagine the time that they have, that is involved in that? And the dyes, the colors that they use are all natural. Natural dyes are used. Okay, so it does not leave easily. It does not, you know, there is no uh, any mixture of colors but it is pure and it is natural and the fabric that is coming is also natural fibers what are those natural fibers we can say cotton we can say jute we can say um, silk okay these are all natural fibers and the work done see when you see sometimes in uh, some places like Gautamala there are people who still want don't want to give up this hand weaving and because of that there are about uh, near less than 100 families where they still are into this hand weaving okay and so and one or two people in a, a house will be doing this so what does it mean it involves very less energy while the others will be into some other business these people will be still going on with their traditional method of weaving and it is less costly and but the end product that we get out of hand weaving is coarse, means rough. The fibers that are woven together, you could even see some knots in between and you could see the coarseness or the roughness there, that is coarse. But when you come to these power looms, now everything is replaced by power looms. Why? Because the need is so much, the demand is so much and the supply isn't enough. Okay, so we go on to power looms and everything is mechanized. What do you mean by mechanized? Everything is done by machines. Of course, there are human beings to monitor, but then the most of the work is done by machines. So the time that 20 people take would be done by just two people here. And the whole week they have woven one meter cloth or fabric, it would be done in just 10 minutes here. Okay, so here, but we, can, we are making use of synthetic fibers, okay? And also a blend of different fibers combined together. Like you have poly cotton, poly silk and so many other things that are blending together. Then you have more energy is required. When it's a power loom, when it's mechanized, you need a lot of energy. And to set up a machine like that, a weaving machine like that, it takes a lot, lot of money too. Okay, so it is expensive to initially invest on it, okay? But the finish of the fabric is very smooth. So these are the differences basically between uh, these two technologies as far as weaving is concerned. When you come to fishing, there are some of these methods that are still followed in the modern technology also. Like earlier, we used to have fishing rods. If we uh, take it as a hobby, what we would do, we'd go to the rivers, we would stay, sit there and have a bait there and then there is a hook attached to the fishing rod and wait and wait and wait till we get and oh, what an excitement to get a fish, isn't it? And then you have baskets that in the course of the river, they would place those baskets there which will be meshed okay and as the water runs through or flows through the fish would be staying back in the basket and the water goes off and then they catch the fish so these are all old methods here and long line fishing this is another thing that has been uh, used even till date today this long line fishing is of much use for the tuna fish catching in Cochin Harbor okay and there are about 80 85,000 tons of fish that are 
collected per annum. Can you imagine? So that's exported. So it's quite a good source of income there. And this long line fishing is eco-friendly. Okay, this does not affect the fish or the it does not uh, affect the other fish that comes on the way. If there is long fish, big fishes that come on the way and are caught, they are let back into the ocean. So that's the long line fishing. Then there is something called electro fishing. What do you do? You stun the fish with electricity and then there is a net in which the fish falls and temporarily the fish is under a shock. This is usually used. This is an eco-friendly one if it is used in the proper way and you can use it to monitor the weight and the number of fishes that are there in one particular area all for study and research purposes. They use this method electrofishing because nothing happens to the fish. Then trawling and dredging are modern methods which are not at all eco-friendly because they go into the floor of the ocean and huge nets are just pulled, geared up in the floor of the ocean. That also affects the kelp beds and then the spawning of fish is being affected because of this. Okay, so these are the methods that we have indigenous as well as modern technology in weaving and fishing. Now moving on to the need for developing intermediate and appropriate technology. See, there was a time when we could use anything and everything in whatever method possible. Nobody bothered because the resources were so much, nobody bothered about it. Okay, So that was the ancient method. They used to make use of muscle power. So if they are strong enough, they would catch so much of fish. It's like that. Okay, If they are strong enough, they could weave for hours together. So it was muscle power basically. Then it was about fuel wood. Okay, They used to collect fuel wood. What is that? Wood from the forest and the trees. They would collect it and and they would make uh, energy out of it, okay, and water. These were some of the sources of energy that were used in ancient times, okay. But then, what happened was, as the resources started declining, in the sense, the demand for energy was more and the supply was less. There was something... The, uh, just opposite to each other and it didn't match okay it did not tally the demand and supply never tallied that is when it resulted in energy crisis okay so this crisis means what when the ancient slowly transformed into an industrial revolution this happened in the 19th and 20th centuries what happened was everything started become mechanized like we saw in the case of weaving we saw in the case of fishing everything becomes mechanized when machines started taking over most of the machines if you see you see our gadgets that we use take our washing machines dishwashers okay or microwave ovens or mixers whatever you want you take everything has to run our televisions on electricity where do we get this where's the source of this electricity all these things electricity is what it's one kind of energy and this all different kinds of energy now are focused or cornered into one kind the major demand today is electricity electrical energy okay so that is where this energy crisis comes where do we go for this there are two sources one is conventional sources and one is non-conventional sources that gives us energy conventional sources are non-renewable sources okay what do you mean by that you cannot get back see when you take fossil fuels when living organisms die in the earth what happens uh, it takes thousands of years for these fossils to develop into carbon and then you get coal out of it. Coal is a type of carbon. Then you have petroleum. Petroleum also comes like that. It takes many, many years for it to be formed. And then the fuel wood, trees. Do you think you can just plant a tree and next year you would be able to cut it down? No, it takes nearly 10, 15 years for a tree to grow to its maximum. And imagine you're chopping it down in no time, not even 15 minutes. Okay, so these are non-renewable 
resources basically more than the fuel wood coal petroleum and natural gas which comes from fossil fuels are called as conventional sources or non renewable sources okay now going to the next form of energy it's non conventional sources it's just the opposite of this that means it's renewable what do you mean by renewable you can keep on getting it again and again and again there is no need to have a tally between demand and supply at all as much as you need it is already there okay that's why you say inexhaustible okay some of the students you people will be like that no when you are in the class you will constantly be active 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 you never feel tired and the teacher says hey how much of energy do you have you are inexhaustible that is what these sources are non conventional sources they are renewable sources and they are inexhaustible what are they the main important thing is solar energy yes solar energy the sun never uh, forgets to rise and never forgets to set okay so the sun rises is there sun rays are there as long as there is a sun so that's solar energy and then there's the wind energy then you have the biogas you have geothermal energy you have nuclear energy and different varieties of renewable energy okay now let us move on to these uh, conventional sources with the thermal power plant now we'll move on to the limitation we saw all the conventional and non conventional sources right now we go to the limitations of all conventional sources so there is a limit for everything now we have reached that point okay and with analysis we are going to do an analysis of the power sector with reference to thermal power plants that's what we are going to do now now when you come to the thermal power plants we need to know what these thermal power plants therm means something to do with heat okay and power energy that's what we need how do we get this energy we generate electricity if you see this diagram electricity is generated how do you get it from a fuel source this is basically you take a boiler and what will be boiled there water so there must be a source of water for this thermal power plant and this water is boiled and it becomes steam and this steam is used to run an electric turbine that generates electricity that's what this diagram is about see the fuel is here and then you get the of course there's a lot of smoke that's coming out and there is also a lot of pollutants that are let into the atmosphere but we should not forget that there are this is actually makes this makes up 71% of the power generation see just re, now we saw that all that we need is in the form of electrical energy and where do we get this electricity there must be some sources and one of the important sources is the thermal power plants okay and 70% of this is power generation is from this thermal power plants and what are the sources see there are different sources for the thermal power plants the main three main sources that we use in india are coal petroleum and natural gas now when you talk about coal coal is the major source and we know that coal we get from coal mines and it takes thousands of years for this coal to form and there are different types of coal okay there are low grade coals and high grade coal better grade excellent so there are different ranges of coal that are formed depending on the number of years that is just taken to form so based on that when you take the low grade coals these low grade coals can have a lot of sulfur content in them okay so when sulfur is present what happens is this sulfur when it is heated remember we are boiling it and using the boiler and then it is converted so in the process of converting and when this fuel is this is used as a fuel what happens is the sulfur in the coal gets oxidized to form sulfur dioxide and sometimes with further with oxygen it can form sulfur trioxide all these are possible oxides of sulfur now what happens this combines with water to give acid rain okay so this is the source of acid rain which is very dangerous sometimes acres of land can be just charred trees can be charred because of acid rain okay so that is one of the 
problem with coal okay not only that when you go to coal mines when it's burning sometimes when the coal starts burning up there there can be complete combustion there can be incomplete and if it doesn't burn completely like you take in the thermal power plants itself if it doesn't burn completely it results in carbon monoxide and even inside the coal mines this carbon monoxide is released along with the coal okay so these are two major setbacks of this coal being used as a fuel source the next source that we have is petroleum again petroleum products comes from crude oil from crude oil we get petroleum products mostly the source that we use here is diesel and natural gas of course now when you take this petroleum products see what all they can give when it undergoes combustion look at the amount of smoke that is produced from the thermal power plants this contains gases like carbon dioxide fly ash fly ash are small particulate matters which will just lie suspended in the atmosphere they will not even settle down and when we keep breathing that air what would happen we would be breathing in these particles and those particles go and settle down in the lungs that's why we suffer from asthmatic problems and other things in the lungs okay then you have carbon monoxide here also petroleum products also give rise to carbon monoxide so if you see here and you should not forget that there are oxides of nitrogen also that are produced here so you have carbon dioxide you have fly ash you have carbon monoxide all these things are mainly due to petroleum used as a fuel for this thermal power plant then comes the natural gas when you come to natural gas this is 85 percent and above made of a gas called methane and apart from methane it also releases carbon dioxide okay um, but it contains lesser amount of oxides of sulfur and nitrogen that is not there that advantage is there with natural gas but carbon dioxide if you see it is emitted by everything carbon monoxide also is emitted here and here so what happens this carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that results in global warming if the amount of carbon dioxide emitted exceeds the limit that only results in global warming and when the glo globe as such is getting warmer and warmer what happens because of that we face tsunamis and natural calamities that are so unexpected seasons are changing rainfalls are changing everything happens because of that so let us try to find out some non-conventional sources of energy that can replace or that, that can substitute these conventional sources. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you had liked it, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Bye-bye.